And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me, I have a newcomer to the temple, creator of the astrology-themed board game Zodiac War. He is a he is a professional engineer. He he is a um, fo he is a footballer, though we won't, though we here in the temple won't hold it against him. Eh. And a and a man of many talents, the one and only Mr. Star. Don't call him Dark. Paul Star. How are you doing tonight? Very good, thank you. Thank you for inviting me. <laughs> thank you for thank you for coming on. I um. I held myself back a bit. I was very tempted to make one Man United joke, but nah. Well, <laughs> I'm a Man City fan. Oh. Well, at least you won't get a pizza thrown at you. No. <laughs> oh. Best team in the world. Look, my my policy is my policy is very simple. I root for any team that's beating Chelsea. That's a good philosophy to have. <laughs> oh. Of course, one of course one of my one of my friends um when they saw some of the old feuds that uh, Man United and, and Arsenal had they had said I think I think I'll be a fan of Arsenal. They seem like winners. Oh, that was a mistake. <laughs> You know that you know the moments of the shoulder devil who's who who is in, not the shoulder devil but the shoulder angel who um, is reminding you of your morals and to be a good person. I didn't hear a peep out of that guy. All I heard was my shoulder devil going, "Say nothing. Let them experience the pain firsthand." It's a very wise shoulder devil. It sounds like to me. But <laughs> so. Getting that aside, I'll, I like to start with the humble beginnings, as it were. So, there's two there's two angles yeah. I could ta I could tackle when it comes to humble beginnings, and I'll go I'll go with one then the other. The first is what was your intro what was your introduction to going really all in on um, board gaming? Because there, there's obviously the entry level board games that pe that we all played that we all played in one form or another as kids, whether it be Sorry or Shoots and Ladders or or the Death March that is Monopoly, but then there's the more advanced stuff. I'm curious. How, I'm curious about your journey when it comes to board gaming. Well, I um, I'm not that young, so I was um, I was around playing board games long before computers. Mm -hmm. So board games were was one of my primary entertainments. Um, and the sort of games we had back then were, as you just said, Monopoly. <laughs> I didn't really play that much, though. Um, things like what we call in England Cluedo, but you call over here Clue. Mm -hmm. um, Risk. And I had various other interesting games like Totopoly, which is a horse racing mm -hmm. game. Magnificent Race, which was a bit like the Wacky Races. Uh, Formula One, which is a bit like Formula D. Um, we had all these sort of games. Oh, and Scrabble. I used to be good at Scrabble. Chess. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I've always played games all the way from when I was just a kid. When we had, um, when we had nice summers in England. We would get a, a blankets out, play a board game in the back garden. Um, it was always a way of entertainment. Yep. So I've always been a big board game fan. I hope you weren't unfortunate enough to play the campaign for North Africa because nobody ever plays that. They just they just set it up until until the arguing starts. Yeah, it wasn't until much later when I went to university I started playing really complex games. Mm -hmm. oh. Um. Most of the games I used to play were, were family-type games, mm -hmm. which the whole family could play. But then I got into the more heavy stuff. There's a game I've got called Freedom in the Galaxy, and that's 
I don't know if you've heard of that, but um, that's like you set all these tiles out and you have all these cards and you have all these tokens and it's a bit like those Avalon Hill type games. Yeah, and obviously around that time Avalon Hill was bit, was um, one of the dominant forces when it came to board gaming. Yeah. Um, I am cu- I am curious if around the, if around that time um, you were exposed to Settlers of Catan because. I know in um, in I've ha- I've had some people some people in the UK and especially in Europe um, talk about how they cut their teeth on that game. No, um, I'm I'm a bit older than that, I think. Um, Settlers Catan for me didn't come until much later, and I bought it. Well, maybe only about ten or fifteen years ago. Mm-hmm. Now, the other half of the origins um, question deals with deals with astrology since obviously with a name like zodiac war that uh, astrology is going to f- is going to feature hugely and what i'm curious about is what got you into astrology and w- for in your experience what's the draw i i um was interested i think i've always been interested in astrology um Probably more in my teenager years um, was when I really started getting interested. Um, I enjoyed reading horoscopes and wondering what the day was going to bring me and hoping it would if it was good and hoping it wouldn't if it was bad. Mm -hmm. Um, And it sort of drew me into actually learning a bit about it. I'm not an astrologer, Mm -hmm. but... I have taken an interest in astrology for most of my life, and I know the basics. Um, so I started buying books, and I, st- I was particularly interested in personalities. You know, whether whether people I knew under a particular sun sign really did match those personalities, mm-hmm. whether astrology was real or whether it was fake and how you actually do it and how you know where the planets are and how those planets influence how your day goes. And but the thing that really fascinated me was just the simple, the simple things. You know, the simple things really fascinated me about astrology. Things like which planet matched which sign. And the fact that there are four elements, there are 12 signs. So there are three signs in each element. Mm-hmm. And it's quite, it's quite mathematical, really. And I feel comfortable with math because I'm an engineer. Um, 12 is a wonderful number because it has lots of factors. And um, it was all those sort of things. I Oh, and I enjoyed astronomy. So there was, a, there was a synergy there. Constellations, stars, planets, solar system. It's just everything. It's, and add to that the richness of astrology. Um the, the names of the constellations are just so cool. The, the concepts of having 12 personalities that you can match to individuals, the, the mythology behind um, those signs, you know, the Greek mythology, mm-hmm. and the Roman mythology. I think it's mainly Greek, though. And the, the elements are always fascinating. You know the four ancient elements. Um, so it's just a, a rich subject, you know. And then you get into the power of the planets and whether they're exalted or whether they're in fall, or you know, and which constellation they're passing through. Um, it, it's it's such a rich theme for any board game, I think, and it's just surprising. Um, there's very, very few things out there that are based on astrology in, in the way of board games. Mm-hmm. And what's nice about my game, I think, is it is based on genuine astrological themes. It's not like I've taken the idea of astrology and then made up the rest. I've, I've actually tried to build it around the reality of what 
astrology represents. Yeah. Yeah. And that now when I when I um when I did my research on the whole idea of a zodiac board game, I did find a I did find a few attempts, but a lot of them were rather static as far as the board is concerned. Uh, and one of the big um, th one of the big things that was a standout from what I saw of Zodiac War is the ro is the rotating board. And what I'm curious about is what gave you the idea to do that to do this uh, multiple circle rotating board um, concept. Well, interestingly, my concepts of the game started with the board, and. It was my other life experiences that drew me to astrology with that concept. But the, the reason a rotating board became my um, influence or um, catalyst for an idea was I, about five years ago, I discovered Kickstarter. Now, others may have already discovered it, but I only discovered it five years ago. And I got pretty addicted. I was buying everything. And I was buying some real trash. <laughs> and I bought a game. I bought a game with a rotating board. And I'm not going to mention it, but um, I was disappointed. I felt if you're going to say a game has a rotating board, then it needs to rotate. And it needs to have a reason to rotate. You know, it has to be part of the game. It doesn't have to be a gimmick. So I thought about, you know, this can be done better. And as I thought about that, I thought, well, if I'm going to make a board game that has a rotating board that has meaning and has use, then I know for a fact that the Zodiac wheel will be perfect for this idea. And I already knew a lot about astrology. So I already knew there were 12 signs. And 12 signs, well, that's quite easy to divide a circle into, 12. And I knew there were four elements. So fortunately, I could divide 12 into four. And I also knew that um, each star sign matched a planet, particularly in modern astrology. Mm -hmm. And it all sort of came together from that. I came up with the idea very quickly. I have photos of my first <laughs> concept, which was literally three concentric circles piled on top of each other with these um, astrological symbols drawn on it. And that's how my game started. Right, that ma that <laughs> definitely makes sense. Makes sense. Um, um, now, when it comes to the when it comes to the components be beyond that, um, something that something that I did something that I did note when I looked at demonstrations and the like is the fact that the that the key with the board the key with the board is, for lack of a better term, territory control, or map or a kind or a kind of map control, so that you so that you're trying to maneuver it so it gives you the best alignment. Right. Would would that be a fair descriptor of the kind of meta that the that the game is shooting for, where the um, where it's best to try and get the right the the right movements to give you the maximum results? Yes, yeah, so the the you know sort of marrying your question to the discussion about how the game developed. Um, yes, the the original idea, and it's still the theme of this game was that we have each sign matching a planet and an element. And I always knew that that's what I wanted the board to do. I wanted the players to turn the board so they could get a perfect match for their sign that they are playing in the game. Mm -hmm. So yes, the concept is move the planet to match the sign and move the element to match the sign, and when you achieve that, then something good will happen. Yeah. But you have to consider other players might be wanting to stop you. Um, but then the question is, 
how do I do that? You know, um, I can't just have someone turn the board. They'll win every time. You know, it has to be, it has to be a mechanic to make the board move. So that's when, that's when I had the idea of cards to move the board. And I had dice early on in the um, early on in the development. I had dice and cards moving the board. And it got too cumbersome, too random. Um, so then I ditched the dice and it's all cards. And the cards are based on tarot. Um, and that was an interesting development in its own right. I started off with cards that just I had two decks of cards at first, mm -hmm. one for exaltation and one for fall. And if you don't know anything about astrology, all that means is some planets have a good effect on a sign and other planets have a bad effect on a sign. And when these planets go into the, your constellation, it's either called exaltation or fall. Mm -hmm. And... I thought, okay, two decks of cards, one exaltation, one fall. All the good cards are in the exaltation deck and all the bad cards are in the fall deck. So what, what my original concept was is players would buy these cards and they'd buy good ones to have a good effect on themselves mm -hmm. and they would buy bad ones to have an effect on other players. So that's how it started. But then... During playtesting, someone someone had the idea of combining those two decks. So now when you're paying for them, you it's random whether you get a good or a bad one mm -hmm. instead of knowing whether you're getting a good and bad one. And that was a good idea because everybody wanted the good cards, surprisingly. Yeah. <laughs> but most people felt more comfortable looking after themselves than trying to mess with other players. Mm -hmm. So, so that, so that ended up being a deck. And then I thought, Oh, maybe, maybe I should use tarot cards because tarot card is basically a five suited deck. And one suit is the major arcana, which is the 22 cards you commonly see on television and, in movies mm -hmm. where the um, fortune teller turns over a card and it's like the devil or something and something bad's going to happen. Um, you know, you know, the drama I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. Well, that's, that's all you really see of a tarot deck, but there's a lot, there's actually 78 cards and there are four more suits. And those four suits are coins, cups, swords, and wands. And each of those suits is 14 cards and they're called the minor arcana. Mm -hmm. So I started to gravitate towards just using the major arcana because they're cool, right? So I now had a major arcana deck, which cost even more. The way that got introduced is it cost even more. And somebody, another play tester said, why, why don't you just have a tarot deck? Because that would be cool. You know, have 78 cards. And I thought, well, that's a lot of cards. And um, I've got this, all these exaltation cards, and I've got all these fall cards. And I thought, I don't need those. I could have a tarot deck. <laughs> so that's what happened. I, I ended up making all the cards in the game one deck the um, tarot deck and that deck does everything I described. It moves the board, it can affect other players and it can benefit you when you play them. And it, which it does, you can choose when you play these cards. Yep. yep. And, and now the, I'm, I'm, guess, I'm guessing <laughs> that, that not wanting to have too big of a deck is the reason why you have eight. You have two decks in the form of zodiac and tarot. 
Yeah, the the um, the Zodiac deck came out of the original Exaltation and Fall decks because the original concept was they would be planet related, and they would um, they would move the board to align a planet with your sign, the Zodiac deck. But when I came up with the idea of a tarot deck, then the Zodiac deck changed as well. The Zodiac deck then became the planet deck, and that's all it does now. Mm -hmm. The tarot deck is a tarot deck. And now the, the, you, don't, you, never, you never take a Zodiac card. It never ends up in your hand. Um, the Zodiac deck is like like a horoscope at the beginning of your turn. It will tell you where the planets are and it might give you bonuses based on what sign you are. Um, and it just sort of sets the scene for your turn. And then you play your tarot cards. And when it, when it comes to the, when it comes to the uh, tarot cards, um, First off, when, first off, in the rules it stated that you can play up to th up to three of them. Um, was that was that number always set in stone, or what, or was that a number that you kind of um, gravitate towards during play testing? That that again came out of play testing. Uh, originally, you could play as many cards as you liked, and it was all a matter of um, having the cards and mm -hmm. playing them. Um, in order to achieve a goal. And of course, the goal, the ultimate goal, was to align the board. Um, but what happened in playtesting is some people would have very long turns. You've seen that in deck building games anyway, probably. Oh, yeah. Where, where you know, particularly things like Magic or, um, you know, things like Legends, where you where you just get a particularly good hand and you can keep drawing and you can keep piling it on and you end up just hogging the gameplay for ages while the other player just sits and watches you. Mm -hmm. um, that sort of happened in my game in playtesting. So someone had the idea that as we have um, tarot cards, tarot cards are normally played in a finite number. Yeah, When you're doing a reading, you might play three cards or you might play four cards not play i mean place um and then you do the reading so that's that was what the idea ended up being what what if we just play three cards then everybody has an equal turn everybody has a fair share of the game time and it's consistent with the theme of tarot reading so that's how that came about. Yep. Yeah. Nah. Now, um, I I will admit that that's one of the things that immediately came to mind because if doing the whole as many cards as you want, I could see that result in um, hand dumping or in some or in some cases people ho people hoarding cards until the, until they just dump them all in one go. Um, in role-playing games, this particular phenomenon is referred to as nova ink. Right. And yes. Um, go ahead, sorry. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. I didn't mean to cut you off. No, I, I was just going to agree with you that, that from my playtesting, that, that did become a concern, mm -hmm. particularly when you have more players and everybody wants their turn. It didn't seem fair that some people would have better cards that led to longer turns. Yeah. And given th given that when you were doing playtesting were th were there any playtests that you did that you did where you put people on a turn timer? No. Never. Ah, all right. No, I never did that. I always timed the game. Mm -hmm. I always took a note of how many people were playing, what sign they were playing, and how long the game took to play. Mm -hmm. But no, I never timed it by turn. Yeah. Now, when it comes to when it comes to the when it comes to the effects within tar within tarot cards, it's 
it talks about being able to use them to move the board, collect faith, or attack. Um, now the first two I can get, I can gather how that's going to work. Could you go into what attacking opponents it entails in this particular game and how high risk, high reward it is to do that compared to the other actions? Well, the the goal of the game. I ought to talk about the goal of mm -hmm. the game in order to put that into context. The goal of the game is to align the board and buy what are called star crystals. The star crystals are used to illuminate your constellation, and the signs or the players are competing to have the brightest constellation to win the game, and that is signified by having three star crystals. So in other words, you have to align the board three times and avoid being attacked by other players when you do that um, in order to win the game. But to buy a star crystal, not only do you have to align the board, you have to buy the star crystal with 10 faith. Now, faith is like a currency in the game mm -hmm. that, is, that represents the strength of your followers. So you're, you're constantly trying to attract followers throughout the game. Um, there are many ways of um, gathering followers. One of them is by playing your tarot cards, you can gain faith. By aligning the board even partially, you can partially align the board. For example, you can align your planet with your sign, fail to get the element alignment and still earn faith. And the Zodiac cards can give you faith. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of faith flowing around. And it's that faith you need. You need 10 of them, which is quite a lot, to buy a star crystal. So you have to have two things happen at the same time. Align the board and have 10 faith. It's the, it's the faith that is vulnerable. Other players can attack your faith. Mm -hmm. So when you play um, tarot cards, you can actually take another player's faith away from them. And that's what the attack entails. So yes, you can mess up someone's plan. They could, they could have hoarded, say, even 12 faith. But if you take four away, they can't buy a star crystal. Yeah. yeah. And further, furthermore... Yeah. One of the one of the one of the other things that I did that I was curious about in, within the setup are the are the uh, player boards, which obviously there's twelve of them, each representing a figure in the zodiac. And what I'm curious about with those player boards is how much of a factor do they play in determining someone's approach or someone's play style within within Zodiac War. The yeah, they, they get, the player mats contain important information to play the game. And the most important information on there is which planet you are and which element you are. Mm -hmm. But in addition to that, you have a power. Your power is based on your astrological sign that you're playing. So, for example, um, if you are Leo... Leos are known for being outgoing, extroverted, charismatic, um, vain. <laughs> I'm a Leo. Same here. <laughs> and, <laughs> and so that the special ability that Leo has is he can attract more, more followers when he buys followers because he, he doesn't just attract followers. He attracts lots of followers because he's such a nice guy. Um, and the other, the other um, signs have similar sorts of abilities. For example, um, cancer. Cancer is known for being fairly defensive and, um, you know, they have a shell, so they like to stay within their shell and be protective of themselves. Mm -hmm. so, so cancer can protect some of its faith from attack because it, it's, it's naturally reluctant to engage in this war. So it's trying to protect its resources instead of going all out. 
Then you have Ares, who, you know, is God of War and quite aggressive, a fire sign. So that they, Ares can actually take faith from another player. Um, so each sign has an ability. It's not a super powerful ability, but it can influence what strategy you employ. Mm -hmm. But it's not meant to be... It's not meant to dominate the game. You know, the, the power is there to assist your strategy. And in playtesting, I can assure you there are lots of ways of winning this game. Mm -hmm. People can be aggressive. People can be passive. People can focus on what they want to do, or they can focus on stopping other people from doing what they want to do. But at the end of the day, there's a lot of strategies that could work to win the game. Now, when when it came to developing the the effects, because um, whenever whenever there's some sort of game that that utilizes hero characters with innate effects, um, there's oftentimes the danger of ma of making one ability a little bit more useful than other than others relatively. When you were playtesting, were there were there any instances you can think of of a ability get a ability being a little a little um too advantageous and had to be dialed back? I've gone through many iterations of the abilities. Um, I, I'm struggling to remember a particularly powerful one. It's just that I think instead of Instead of an ability being super powerful, I've, I've had a few that have been super weak. Um, they really did not, um, even though it seemed like a good idea and was thoroughly aligned with the personality type of that sign, it never happened or it wasn't useful or the player didn't have a desire to use that ability because there was something else he could do in the game that was more meaningful to them. So, yeah, I, I ended up, I've been through a lot of iterations of the powers. And in order to make them fair and equal, I've generally measured them in terms of their equivalent value in faith. So, for example, if you can gain three faith because you're charismatic, then another player may be able to get something for three faith, like a free tarot card or something. Mm -hmm. So, generally, the value of the powers is fairly similar, yeah. not identical. And depending how you use it, it can be powerful or it can be weak, but they are fairly balanced. Yeah. Now, when I look at the element ring within the, within the, uh, within the, um, within the, uh, within the rings, um, I'm curious what the F is intent is intended to represent on that. Yeah, and I'm, maybe I should have a little um, uh, vote as to how that can be replaced with something more cool. But what the F represents is F for faith. And what it's representing is it's a wild card on that ring. And if you're trying to align the board and you can't get what I call a perfect alignment, which is where you actually align with your element, you can align with the F and still get a minor alignment of mm -hmm. elements and sign and the, the reward for that. And the reason for that is it's easier to align elements than it is to align planets. So I wanted to, to simulate that. You know, there's more, more elements, so it's easier to align them. Yeah. Now, th now, what I find it, what I find interesting is that you've um, you've described this game as for two to five players. When when I look when I look at something like this, especially with the whole four elements thing, you would, a assumption that I'd end up com coming to is that this would be that this would be two to four. Um, Actually, interestingly, it is two to four players, but a stretch goal took it to five at um, some backers' request. Um, Strictly speaking, it, it originally was with six and I I drew it back because four was much more um, 
much better number because first of all it's consistent with the numbers we use in the game mm -hmm. um secondly we're playing around a circular board so four is pretty symmetrical to sit around a, a table mm -hmm. and um it also minimizes the number of players involved in the game so that people get a turn more often all right um but now there's five through a stretch goal mm -hmm. Um, now you mentioned you, t you mentioned you, t you, uh, timed play tests. What was the, what was the average time for, two, for a straight up, um, two player game? And what was the average time for say four players? If you, um, categorize it as such. Yeah. So, um, a couple of comments on that before I give you numbers. Um, the game is pretty easy to learn. And once you once you get the um, once you're familiar with it, it's quite quick to play um, because the game is played like a lot of card games actually in a series of phases. And if you follow those phases, you'll find that they're logical. Mm -hmm. And once you've caught onto the logic of them, you don't even need to remember it. You just do it, right? So, so it gets quick, and it works with two players pretty good. Um, that takes, if it's two players who are familiar with the game, I would say it could take 30 minutes unless those two players are very aggressive and, um, you know, prevent the other player playing. And mm -hmm. being two players, that means all the players are being prevented from playing. <laughs> um, then it, it could take maybe 45 minutes. Yeah. Um, the... Three players, again, 45 minutes to an hour. Four players, an hour to an hour and a quarter. And five players, maybe an hour and a half. Mm -hmm. Now, something I'm curious about when it comes to the notion of Zodiac and Tarot cards. Because even no matter how much, it sounds like no matter how much um, faith that someone has, they, w they will... Play, uh, they will play the top zodiac card at the start of at the start of their turn. And would it be fair of me to say that zo that that um zodiac cards are the are the great are the greater, for lack of a better term, wild card in terms of in terms of their effects? Or are there some tarot cards that are going to have effects that are a bit non-standard? Sorry, are you talking about the zodiac cards or the tarot cards? Um. I thought you were asking about zodiac cards. I'm, I'm asking about I'm asking about Zo I'm asking about zodiac cards first. Like, is right. that is that going to be the, for lack of a better term, wild card wild card effect when it comes to the when it comes to the game's flow? Yes, it is. Um, it, it is pretty wild. <laughs> what what the zodiac card does is it shifts the planets, it shifts the elements, mm -hmm. so. It, I'll come on to that in a minute, but it shifts, it shifts the elements, it, it shifts the planet, and depending on how much the board moves, you can get some bonuses. It also, because it's a planet, it can affect your sign, and you might get a bonus because of that. Mm -hmm. And every other player needs to look at that card, because any player, due to the arrival of that planet, could get a bonus, yeah. or a detriment. Um. So, yes, it, it's when when people are familiar with the zodiac card, they'll all look at it, and they'll all take whatever that card gives them, and that takes just seconds. As as you get familiar with the game, you turn the card over, you take the actions, and you then move to your turn. Yep. Now, when it comes to actions on so, on a given person's turn, is it largely so is it is someone's turn a largely self-contained affair or are there certain cards or effects that could provoke interrupts by other players yeah um your turn is described in five phases but um it's really four because the fifth phase is you end your turn mm -hmm. um the first phase is you you play the zodiac card then you play your tarot cards. That's the second. 
then you turn the board and take whatever uh, rewards you earn from the board, including buying star crystals. Then you can buy more cards. So you use faith to buy more cards. So there's, even though you think you have a lot of faith, you still need it to get more cards. Otherwise, you your game will stagnate. And then you turn in. So they're the five phases. While you're doing that, that there are interrupt cards in the tarot deck. And as you play your cards, other players can interrupt the effects of those cards and just totally now get negate that card that's played. Mm -hmm. um, interestingly, though, an interrupt card can be interrupted. <laughs> so you can end up with an interrupt battle. Or interruptception. Yeah. <laughs> oh. An extra phase called interrupt. Um, and that, yeah, so that's that's how that works. But but the major arcana have some abil interesting abilities too. There are some, the major arcana are powerful. They have some very effective powers that can interrupt another player. Not always, but there are some fairly powerful interrupts and that don't just interrupt, you know, the strength card in the major arcana can actually steal another player's card as they play it. So before it activates, you can take it, mm -hmm. which is doubly powerful. First of all, it stops them. But secondly, you can choose which card you take because you're taking the card they're playing. Yeah. Now, within the rules, have you, have you dedicated any space to, to variant games? Because in some board games, you do ha you do have rules set aside for people who want to vary up the uh, rule set in the game that they're playing or add some sort of monkey wrench into the equation. Yeah, absolutely. There's um, plenty of opportunity for variant rules. And I, I will be including variant rules in the rule set. Um, of course, the next um, stretch goal that's coming up is solo mode. That that is going to be a thing. So they're varying the rules. Um, others are you can, for example, the, the standard rules say play for three star crystals. Mm -hmm. But as a house rule, you can vary that. If you want a shorter game, you can have less. If you want a longer game, you can have more. Yeah. Um, there's also um, interrupts is another variant you can play without interrupts for a more peaceful game more of a strategic game without the chaos of interrupts um so there's there there's some that i already have on my list and i'm thinking about more because there is plenty of opportunity for that um given the given the way the tarot cards work i could i could see one person suggesting a variant where um, you have to play all three all three effects, if it if at all possible, of just one tarot card. That's something I could see happening. Um, at least in theory. Uh, yeah, I see, I see what you're saying. Yeah. Oh. So it ba it basically means you'd have to you. You'd only be playing what you'd only be playing one card, and you'd basically ha it'd basically be for people who want to do a longer game but still have a degree of chaos. Yeah, that would be pretty cool. Um, now, yeah, that would. Be. Now, um, you've had, you've certainly you've certainly gotten some ve some very fantastic artwork when it comes to Zodiac War, um, and I'm cu what I'm curious about is how you yes. and go ahead. I'm not saying anything. <laughs> <laughs> well, what I was curious about is how is how you got how you got in touch with the two, with the two primary um, artists for for the project. Um, now the fir the first one I'm probably going to mispronounce her name and I apologize in advance. Katerina Poliakova. That's very good. And the second one being Connor Smith. How did you get in touch with those two? They the game actually started with me. I, I had this vision of um, what I wanted these signs to look like, mm -hmm. but I'm not an artist. I'm not an artist. I, even, I thought I was until I tried drawing something and then I realized I wasn't. Um, 
So I knew what they wanted. I, 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 I've been a role player um, RPG for quite some time as well as board games. And I, I imagine that the, each of these signs is being character classes. So I wrote up descriptions, but then I had to find an artist. And I went to Art Station, if you've heard of that. Oh, yeah. Uh, it's like Deviant Art, but um, the artists seem more approachable. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I just basically sort of sent emails out to art, artists that I liked the look of their art. And one of those was Katerina. And she responded saying, yes, she would do the art. And um, when, when I found her, she was newly out of university. So she was looking for a portfolio. But when she started doing this artwork, it just blew my mind. It was way better <laughs> than I hoped it would be. Um, and it was Katerina who, um, she, she really became passionate about the game. She went way beyond her contractual obligations. She, she got really engaged and she, um, she helped design the board and she, and she was going to do all 12 of the signs, but it became too demanding. She had, um, she had other projects she needed to do. She was becoming more well-known and more popular and she couldn't fulfill that obligation. So I, I went looking for um, another artist, but I wanted an artist, of course, who could complement what Katerina had done. But I did it the same way. I went to Art Station and I went searching for artists that um, could fill my vision of what these characters could look like. Mm -hmm. And um, Connor, I found Connor. Um, both, both the artists are actually in England. Um, and he, he was willing to do um, the final six. They did six each in the end um, for what seemed to be a reasonable price. The price had gone up, <laughs> but um, it was a reasonable price. And, um, and he was very, um, what's the word? Um, just like Katarina, he, he was very adaptable. He would listen to my views and he would make the changes I requested. Um, some artists don't do that, you know. So that's that's the story behind the artwork. And when you when you had gotten when you had signed them on, um, did was it a case of just was it a case of just giving them more more or less free more or less free reign to interpret things, or did you have a set of bullet points that you wanted? each sign to focus on thematically yeah i wrote i wrote a paragraph or two about each character i described them in terms of a character class i described them in terms of um what they might look like what they might wear what um what race they might be um and in each case, I tried, I did research into the astrology um, personalities to see if I could get um, a consistency between the, the character class and the personality to represent that particular astro astrological sign. Mm -hmm. And then I would give it to the artists and they would, they would have free reign from there. I didn't influence their artwork. Um, <laughs> that would be on me. But they would always come out with something good. And I would, you know, I'd normally have an opinion about it. I'd normally say, yeah, I really like that, but can you change this? Um, and then they would. Um, but, yeah, it was a collaborative effort, but they did the work. Yeah. Now, you... Now I do want to get. I do want to take this time to congratulate you on managing to get well beyond your initial go your initial goal at eighteen thousand, and at the time of this recording, it's currently sitting at thirty thirty four point two thousand. Um. What? What would you be? Sh now what? What would you be shooting for as far as a release window for the pro for the project? Not a release date per se, but a release window like. What, what quarter of 
of either. You mean when will I? I'm sorry. You mean when will I be delivering the games? When do I perceive that? Yeah. Yeah. Obviously, obviously, this is that's the reason I said I phrase it as release windows because I know this kind of thing is always in flux. There are. It's an interesting time. You know, with the COVID and various economical issues due to that around the world, um, but my target is to is to deliver around about November. I think it's going to take that long, and certainly before Christmas. Mm -hmm. And give, and I can I can def that seems. That seems a that seems a fairly reasonable um, range. Um, when it was it when it came to the whole rotating board thing, was it relatively easy to build the prototype for that and make sure that when somebody's moving the board, that that um that one circle is the only one that moves and others don't get dragged. Yeah, um, it started with a three discs on top of each other and that that didn't work of course because when you turn a disc it's going to turn the disc underneath it mm -hmm. so the design of the board is different to that the the way that the board is designed is it's in two layers you have the baseboard and then the entirety of the board that rotates is the second layer but the sun the sun signs the signs in the middle of the board, not the very center, but the, the middle ring, mm -hmm. um, that's fixed to the baseboard. It doesn't move. So the element ring and the planet ring rotate using the sign ring as the guide for that rotation. All right, I, I got you on that. And Generally, generally speaking, is that do you have do you have it as a rule that it's that any movement of the board is always going is always going to be um, agreed upon as either clockwise or counterclockwise? Yeah, it's a rule. In, that's a good question, actually, because it's a rule in the game to always rotate the board clockwise, um, and there are variations to the rules. Well, not not rule variants like we were talking about before, but. There are things that say um, uh, that the major arcana can do to reverse the rotation of the board, for example. But they, the the general rule is the board board always rotates clockwise. All right. I br I bring that kind of thing up because I could easily see somebody trying to get a little bit too cute with the idea with the idea of rotate of rotating the board one space and they rotate it the one space that'll that'll work in their favor. Yeah. Well, you got that covered. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the uh, uh of course on the other hand it could it could be a good way to generate salt if somebody ends up accidentally overshooting the amount that they need. Cuz then they got to wait for yeah. them to go all the way around again. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and that happens. Well, as we as we say around here, the dice gods show no mercy, even in a game without dice. Yeah. <laughs> the the thing when you are rotating the board is, if say you you have five movement on your card, you don't have to use all five, so you can move three in a line. But it would be interesting if um, you have a house rule rule that's either. And this could be a variance, actually, for more advanced players, that you have to use the number on the card when you're rotating the board. Um, or, and this this is a bit like chess, touch move. If you if you rotate the board and overshoot, maybe players can say, "Hold on, you overshot. You've got to put it where you got to. You can't go backwards." <laughs> yeah. oh. I'm. Um... I'm all, I'm always going to be I'm always going to be in favor of put of putting in mechanics that are so that are solely designed to generate salt. Yeah. Yeah, there's some salt in this game. Oh. And if some if somebody wants to bl if somebody wants a a blame reason for why um well 
I put well give, given some of the given some of the board games that I pl that I played growing up and how absolutely cruel some could be. Up to and in, up to and including Battleship and ye and yes, I was that I was that guy who would who would um mi who would make sure to draw make sure to draw it out as l as long as I could to make someone tense about whether or not this was going to be the shot that sinks. <laughs> <laughs> In other words, you pepper your shots around the ship and make them think you're missing when you really know where they are. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It doesn't doesn't help that doesn't help that some people just don't know how just don't know how to hold a poker face. <laughs> but that is a case of not my problem, but I'll certainly abuse it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um. Yeah, there's some people who enjoy you know some people like a peaceful game, others like to have a bit of friction. Um, this this game can do either. Mm -hmm. um, bear in mind, um, it, it's two two different personality types I'm trying to cater to. We have the gamers who are obviously competitive and they play games to win, but the astrologers are more free spirited and they, they they like the game for what it represents and its educational value. Um, for them, you know, for um, for astrology, it really does teach you the basics of astrology, and they love that very much indeed. So it's going to be interesting to see. I'm basically introducing a whole new um, group of people to game it through this game, and it'll be interesting to see how how they um, how they play it and how how they um, enjoy the game. Mm -hmm. And I'll just, I can certainly say that I'll be looking forward to seeing what sort of salt ins ensues from the from the project because I because um I I always like reminding people that um Lady Luck is never on your side and you should never ever trust her because you may think that she's being nice to you but that's really just to lull you into sense of security before the rug gets pulled out. There's always a surprise around the corner. Yeah. <laughs> um. I think. I think if you had to blame, if you really had to blame something for for that mindset, um. I am one of those longtime DMs, who seems to who seems to know how to make players squirm without doing anything. <laughs> so you have a poker face. What do you think the DM screen is for? <laughs> Yeah, I try to be fair as a DM. Well, I'm so I'm certainly I'm certainly fair, but uh, but um, I am going I am going to punish people for their mistakes. Oh yeah, because uh, hey, we you um would you learned how, you learn not to not to touch your hand on not to put your hand on the stove when you end up burning your hand. It's funny, I, I, we're not meant to be talking about um, role-playing, but as a DM, I designed a rotating ball, uh, rotating door. Mm -hmm. It was a trap. And they had to uh, make saving throws against dexterity in order to, because the, the rotating door was going quite fast, so they had to jump out. I nearly killed the entire party with that thing <laughs> because they were just rolling so badly. <laughs> oh. RN Jesus does not save, but with the, with all that in mind, I did want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the insanity that takes place around here. I appreciate the invite, and I have enjoyed the conversation. So thank you. Mm -hmm. And anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. I appreciate that, and make sure you have the beers lined up at your bar. I. I will do. I will do that, and I um, and I have an unwritten rule that anybody who br anybody who brings in um, like like Budweiser or something like that is publicly flogged. I think that sounds like a very good policy, myself. Um, because again, if you're not again, if you're not going to listen to the rules, then you then the then you're get then um, you got to listen to them the physical way. Um. Exactly. And of and of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come on t to come on to the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here. 
on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody! <laughs>